and really to think about how objects, particularly in Liverpool's collection, this amazing collection, um, help to challenge the colonial record. Now this is interesting because they are the colonial record themselves. They were collected by colonial officers to do colonial work. And if we think about museums, um, they are, of course, a colonial tool. Many museums in the West were made to visualise and represent colonial ideology and colonial ideas. This is, this is why we have so many museums in the West, why we're so preoccupied with them. They have this, this very particular function. And if we think we are preoccupied at the moment in the UK, as I've just left, um, I've just left uh, uh, Sashi Taro, who's come and with his uh, inglorious uh, empire, or uh, in, imperial, in, inglorious in, um, empire, new books to talk about how the British still refuse to recognise colonialism. They don't teach about it in school. Uh, they don't really talk about it uh, in their institutions. And I think museums are are uh, one of those institutions that have found it quite difficult to talk about colonialism, particularly in relation to Tibet. So let's just have a quick recap on what we think uh, or how we see as curators very often, how we see Tibet represented uh, in Western museums. There are two, two real core ideas. We often see Tibet as art in Western museums. This is uh, probably the most popular representation of Tibet in, in visual form, particularly in, in North America. We often see Tibetan uh, things, Tibetan objects, turned into art when they were perhaps never meant to be art in the first place. And we see them, the common denominator between the different ways that Tibet is represented in Western museums is that they are scrubbed clean, wiped very furiously clean of any historical context, any connection to Tibetans or to any other people and places for that matter. And so they're isolated, singularized, made special because of what, uh, what visual uh, richness they show. So we see objects uh, having moved from Lhasa, uh, from Tibet, uh, through British India often, uh, through Tibetan hands into European, into North American hands, but we get no idea of how they have ended up in the Rubin Museum in this, in this situation. I'm just picking on the Rubin Museum. I could pick on any museum in North America or Europe to illustrate that point, but this, this, is, the, this is the point, that they are controlled. They're turned into something new for the museum. So this is Tibetan art, and it's a very popular, uh, popular uh, way of showing Tibet. But we also see Tibet, I'm sure, sorry, my podium here, which is huge, cuts off the important letter, Tibet as ethnographic subject. And we often, we see this in photographs, we get Tibetans as types, uh, the British like to photograph Tibetans in full regalia, very often holding a, a prayer wheel or some money beads. Very rarely did you see Tibetans just in everyday Garb. They had to be completely decked out with all sorts of material markers. They had to have objects that showed that they were Tibetan, and the British liked to photograph in that way. And particularly in the UK, but we also get it in the US as well, the shrine. The shrine has become the thing that Tibet is associated with in the museum. We often see these really quite spectacular assemblages of objects put together from different times, different locations, different contexts. But as a viewer, as a visitor to museums, it's comforting because this is what, to, this is what viewers in the West understand. What they miss from all this is that these objects here from the Horniman Museum in the UK had never been to Tibet. These objects were not from Tibet, they were made in Darjeeling. <laughs> because we know this because of the collector and the diaries that he kept. But still, back in the museum, it becomes Tibetan. What else can it be? So we get, before we even knew that fake news existed, museums created fake news or fake destinations for their visitors. What we also find, and I have to hold my hand up here, I'm criticizing others, so I'm going to criticize World Museum, which is where I work. We also have a shrine. 
very simple, much more simple than the one uh, we saw. But what we do, we create this vision, as I said, of Shangri-La, this place uh, of distance. There are no people in this exhibition. There are no uh, human beings, just objects draped in red with a nice saffron glow to it. Uh, and we have all of these particular methods and ways in the museum that we create uh, these imagined places for our visitors. What we fail to do when we, do th we create these shrines is to mention any of these things. So we do not mention that this tanga here was looted or that uh, this conch shell here was purchased by a Tibetan aristocrat for a colonial officer's collection. We don't actually say that this object here is brand new. We don't say that it was commissioned for Liverpool Museum by a Tibetan refugee now living in the UK. And we don't say anything about the fact that some of these objects were actually gifted. So their histories are incredibly complex. But as I said, they're smoothed out. We move all of these complex and troubling histories all these difficult conversations and all of these different ways of representing Tibet, we wipe those clean. They don't <coughs> help the museum create this nice, controlled, strong image of Tibet. So that's the starting point for me. This is where I come from. This is why I am troubled by the way that Western museums uh, portray Tibet. And I think it is time I think we are ready for a different way of understanding what Tibet can be in a Western museum. Now here, we're obviously, we're standing in a museum that does something quite different. In the West, we have this very, uh, it's almost a comfort blanket. It's something we pull around us, we feel comforted by it, because it, m we feel that we recognise it, and we understand it, and we know it. And this is very important for the museum as a legacy of the colonialism. It's important to know. So if we feel that we know something and we know exactly what we expect to see, then it confirms what our knowledge is. It confirms our worldview. Anything else makes everything seem a little bit unsteady and a little bit shaky. So I just wanted to show you some of the things then in the early stages that we're trying to do at Liverpool to challenge, challenge that view of Tibet. We are starting to get it into the display, but often the, the quickest way that we can challenge these representations is through the website, through digital technology. It's always the easiest way, isn't it? So let me just show you a couple of things uh, that we're doing. I'm hoping my, yes, it does, it's going to work. Um, so the whole point of putting objects online making collections available online, is that we can have this different story. We can tell this different narrative about Tibet. And for me, it's important that we connect Tibetan objects with the people that they've come into contact with, the historical context that they've come from, and the situation that they were collected in. So this is very important for the way that I work. So this portrait of the 13th Dalai Lama that we can see here was actually uh, given to a British officer uh, by, uh, he wasn't called Sarong at that moment in time, but Chensel uh, Nangang, so he was going to be uh, Sarong later on. Uh, but this was given in 1910. And this was given as a, as a, a gift. Uh, you know, Sarong was trying to um, build his relationships with the British. Uh, he was becoming an important individual. Uh, and this portrait of the 13th Dalai Lama had just been taken uh, in Darjeeling, where the da Ooh, we're going to have trouble opening the pictures. That's interesting. Where the Dalai Lama was exiled, not quite under house arrest, but the British uh, were keeping a very close eye on what he did and where he went, uh, and the, the people that he was meeting, and they were. Um, very closely vetting who was coming to see him in Hillside in Darjeeling. It's a quite remote house that they had uh, given, gifted him uh, for his stay. So um, 
we can even date this photograph. So we know the very day that it was taken because Sauron re records it as part of the gift. So it's not just an object that can be uh, used as a, um, a religious object. It could very easily be used as a religious object. But it says a great deal about Tibetan migration, forced migration, exile, uh, and it says a great deal about the British uh, colonial encounter with Tibet in 1910. We also, though, of course, don't take what we know about objects for granted, and we don't just put information there that is never changing. These are live documents, and as you can see here, oh, perhaps you can't see here, but it, it was Tashi Serin, who was on the front row here, who looked at this photograph and said, hmm, I think you're missing something from your documentation. And so it's important that we record that. We say, who is telling us about these objects? We don't suggest that we know everything in the museum, and that is also very important. That what we know is only partial. And that is not something that museums are very uh, keen to do. They like to think that they are the fount of all knowledge. They like to think that they have this very precise, clear picture of what, uh, what their collections are all about. But with the documentation online, we can continually add to this. <coughs> and this is something that I would like to grow. More Tibetan voices, audible in our documentation, visible in what we, what we do. So it's just one example, but you get the idea. So let's go back. Ooh, maybe smaller. Sorry. Oh, wrong one. You don't want to see my files. Okay. Great. But it just gives you a sense. That's, that's one object out of 2,500 objects that we have at National Museums Liverpool. So it's a long process of restoring those historical moments to these objects. But we are doing it. There's about 750, 800 objects that I've personally unpacked, looked at the names that are associated with those objects, and then tried to place them back into the historical context from which they came. It's well worth having a look. Okay, so let's get to this idea of how objects can challenge colonial narratives. I like this idea of the disruptive object. So even though objects, they can't talk to us, well, they might, some might, who knows, I, I talk to objects all the time, but um, they're often silent witnesses to what they've seen over the years. They can't really tell us how they've got to where they are. So we have to do that work for them. But what we do find when we do that work of recovering history and context, that they disrupt what we think we know. This is always good, to be challenged about what we think we know about a certain situation, a certain individual, or a certain event. And there are some objects in National Museums Liverpool's collection that do just that. They challenge the colonial narrative. Now, in 1921, this, this handsome chap here, who I have lived with, although he's been dead for 70 years, I've lived with him for about 15 years now. This is Charles Bell, who's been the subject of my PhD um, uh, yeah, I won't go into him too much, but in 1921, when he came back from spending uh, a year in Lhasa, uh, he gave a speech at the Royal Geographical Society, very prestigious organisation, all the great and good of uh, the colonial world came to listen to him speak. He was a very nervous speaker, so he needed training, but he got up and he made his speech. At the end of the speech... It's that normal thing where time for questions and somebody stands up and says, I have a question and a comment. And actually, it's just a speech that they want to make themselves. They don't want to ask a question. They just want to make their own speech. And this is what Francis Young Husband did. So Francis Young Husband got up in 1921. He was sat at the back and he got up and he decided he was going to make a response to Charles Bell's uh, discussion about Lhasa. And the way that he did that was to reminisce about his own journey to Tibet, to Lhasa, in 1904. One of the things he said, just off the edge of the screen there, 
I'll just read, I'll read a little bit. Not always easy to read a big wall of text like this. But as he was reminiscing, young husband said, well, the only serious trouble we had was with a monk who ran amok. Now, this is a very important phrase. We'll hear it time and again in a moment. So we had a, all the trouble we had was with a monk who ran amok in our camp and suddenly drew out his sword and cut down an officer. We tried the man. There's an important fact missing here, but we'll come to that in a moment. We tried the man and asked him why he had done this. And he said that he was going through our camp. He saw the officer wearing an ugly hat, so he thought he must knock off the hat. And when he knocked the hat off, he saw the officer's face was uglier than the hat, so he thought he would have a slash at that too. All very jovial, isn't it? You know, everybody, I mean, you can imagine everybody laughing in the audience, all the, you know, making fun of the officer. And as he says, you know, the officer was very annoyed about this and kept muttering about it for many months afterwards. Importantly, on the bottom, which is the narrative that young husband loved to portray about the young husband expedition, was, but on the whole, I may say that we parted good friends with the Tibetans. Okay, now if there's ever a piece of fake news, that is it. It wasn't called fake news, of course, it's called propaganda, which is what this was. So we have young husband, 15 years after uh, the mission to Lhasa, reimagining his part in a very bloody and brutal invasion as um, a wonderful, comical, uh, friendly encounter with Tibetans, despite the involvement of swords and facial injuries. Of course, one of the photos that you see here, and I've already mentioned this this, this morning, is uh, the photograph of uh, Gandan Tupa here, looking very tense. He's photographed in Lalu House in uh, August 1904, during the end of the negotiations, uh, just before the signing of the treaty on the 7th of September. So th this is not just uh, a portrait, uh, but it shows, uh, for me anyway, the angst and pensiveness of an individual forced into a very difficult situation. And I think in the West we choose not to read those human qualities about Tibetans. So we have this photograph. Now, not only did he, was he involved in the negotiations with the young husband, but when the British finally um, forced a signature out of Gandantupa on the 7th of September 1904, um, I think, I think Gandantupa was quite relieved and he gave young husband a gift. I think it was a please get out of my country type of gift, but it was a gift um, given um, with, with, the, with ceremony and through proper protocols that uh, Tibetans would use in uh, gift exchange. And this is the figure that was gifted here. And you can see young husband much later in life with, with, the, uh, with the Buddha here. It became almost a lifelong sing symbol for young husband, and he took it everywhere. It was actually placed on his coffin uh, when he died, and people thought that this Buddha had been buried with him, but no, it's actually in the Royal Geographical Society um, today. It was found in a cardboard box a few years ago. Nobody seemed to know what it was, um, but there, there it is. It's now in the Royal Geographical Society. Um, young husband took this Buddha up onto a hill after the signing of the treaty, and as he records in, uh, in his book, he had an epiphany. So he became almost in his own imagining enlightened through having contact with Lhasa. And this Buddha became the symbol of that. So all that was good that had happened to him while he was in, in Lhasa. So he also used those objects as propaganda. Yeah? So we see him he here having sort of material evidence of this friendship that he built with Tibetans. Now, not all objects are willing to tell that story. And they actually want to tell a very different narrative about what happened when the British came to Tibet in 1904. Now, David MacDonald, in 20 years in Tibet, he was a, uh, a trade agent uh, based uh, in one of the British trade agencies uh, in Drummo or Chumbi Valley, as the British knew it, and Gyantse later on. Um, but he was part of the 1904 uh, mission to Tibet. He was half Sikkimese, half Scottish, uh, and so had excellent Tibetan and acted as an interpreter. So he saw the whole thing firsthand. But he had a very colonial mindset in that he, as he recorded in his own book, now this was written perhaps 25 years later, so very rose-tinted glasses. This was a very 
wonderful uh, event uh, in his mind. But he notes objects, and he says very clearly that uh, nothing was looted. Despite, despite the fact that the troops walked past so many houses, monasteries, um, there were amazing and valuable images and bullion, uh, to say nothing of priceless silks, brocades and uh, porcelain, there was very little in the way of looting. Okay. Mm, okay, so that's his version of events, and that was often the version of the events that the British portrayed, that they were um, above these sorts of things, highly civilised, uh, you know, this was not the sort of behaviour that the British would would partake in. And if it happened, it was clearly the work of the Indians or the Sikkimese who were doing the looting and not the British. All right. Well, let's have a look at that. So this is from the London uh, Illustrated News. Uh, and it uh, shows a uh, illustration of the fighting at uh, Guru, as the British called it. Um, you can see here the, the, the Patan, the 47th uh, Regiment, the Patan Regiment, uh, heroic, you know, coming over the walls that were built by Tibetans. The Tibetans seem like a, a mass, a shambolic uh, mass on the other end. Um, there's all sorts of things going on here, but this is you know, showing the military might of the British. Now, what this illustration doesn't show is that when the British had killed uh, several hundred Tibetans uh, on that day, 31st of March, 1904, in Guru, um, they ripped objects off of dead Tibetans. But National Museum's Liverpool's collection records that. So what happened was that junior officers, when they came back to Britain, their port of entry was Liverpool. So they often didn't have a great deal of money, and when they got to Liverpool, they sold the objects in order that they could get home to other parts of the UK. And a junior officer, who we only know as Jay Heaney, we've not been able to find him in any records, gave, or sold, should I say, about 20 or 25 objects to National Museums Liverpool, Liverpool Museum as it was known at that time, and he recorded the site of collection, where he acquired things from. So we start to have that wiping clean of the historical record at the very moment that these objects arrive at the museum. Now, I would like to hedge my bets and say that this was not a gift exchange. And I would suggest that this was taken from a dead Tibetan soldier as a trophy. But it's only one of many. So we here have this uh, bandolier, quite a fabulous thing. But also that same officer, Jay Heaney, when the British were camped at Dronsi Monastery, uh, as they uh, moved, pushed towards Gyanse for their final onslaught between May and July 1904, as the British were camped there, uh, they also looted uh, and destroyed uh, estates and monasteries. And so what we also have are objects like this. And the information that I've got here is actually recorded on the label. So somebody, some British officer, was so proud of what had happened during that, that encounter that they recorded those details. Although they failed to tell us which major, it, just, it literally just says dot, dot, dot on the label. So they refused to name the officer who snatched this gaul from a Tibetan soldier, but they do note that it was taken from a body of a dead Tibetan at Dongsan. So for all of the British, British's civilizing acts, their understanding of themselves as civilized and noble, um, our objects at national museums, these silent witnesses, tell a very different story. Same officer also tells us that this tanka here was taken from a house near Gyantse and Dongse. So nobody is giving this material away. And I think the implication is that the idea of acquired or collected makes these objects sound as if they came quietly. They, you know, just walked out the door themselves and followed the British back to British India. Of course, that's not the case. These were ripped from Lakang. They were ripped from people's homes, uh, and they were rolled up and taken back to British India. Now, this is besides the official collecting that the British were doing. This is sort of the opportunistic collection, collecting that the junior officers were doing. 
There were also thousands and thousands of objects that were collected officially by the British. So these were unofficial, unrecorded collecting sites. And we can hazard a guess as to where this came from, the very estate that this came from, because we know that the British looted and pretty much destroyed the Pala um, estate. So we can have a good guess at to, as to which house Negyan Se and this came from. But we can't say for sure because there's not enough information. So when the British walked into Lhasa, and of course John Claude White has his camera set up there ready for the action shot, one of the few action shots that we, we, we get from John Claude White because it was so difficult to set this laborious uh, camera equipment up. It took eight mules to carry this camera equipment into Lhasa. So this is not an easy task to get these photographs that you can see on display. But as they walked into Lhasa, there'd been um, a memorandum, there'd been an order from the British in India that there was to be no more looting. So the British obviously had to find other ways of collecting objects. They brought in bazaars, of course, small, tiny little things in bazaars, but they were quite creative. So this object, another object in National Museum's Liverpool's collection, um, on a first glance, it looks like it may have nothing to do with Tibet at all. If we were to label this up just on, on face value, on its appearance, we might label it as China and leave it at that. But actually, it's got a very entangled history with Tibet, and particularly September, August, September 1904. Let me tell you how it is connected to Tibet. So that incident, let's take our mind back to that jolly incident that young husband recorded uh, in 1921 from his memory about the, the monk who ran amok in uh, the camp, the British camp. When that happened, at the end, it was probably, I think it was the 27th of August, 1904, that happened, and you know, before social media, with colonial tools of uh, transmitting media, transmitting news, things could go viral. Before we even knew what viral was, things very much went viral. And particular words, particular groups of words are seen again and again. So we see the propaganda machine in full swing. And so when that monk did that, as you see here, Herculean Lama ran amok, in the British camp on the 27th of August 1904, it was not only recorded in the British archives, but it was sent out to all the news agencies via telegraph. So this incident, two days later, was recorded in Australia, in the Adelaide Register. It was recorded in the British The Times. It was recorded in the South China Morning Paper. This, and it was recorded, I think, in the Vancouver News. I've not got a, a copy of this. I'm sorry, these news printouts are quite poor, but it, I've seen this report in almost the same form with the same choice words, Lama runs amok, in several different um, reports in different parts of the world. So this was fixed in the colonial mind, that this huge Herculean Lama had come into the camp and run wild. In the Times, you know, he was a fanatic. He was knocked down and again and again, deprived of his arms, but again and again he shook himself free, fighting with teeth, hands and feet. He proved to be of gigantic proportions. I mean, when we think, when we've got an image of what this man must look like, he, he must be absolutely huge. Again, you know, the unveiling of Lhasa, we've got quotes from Chandler on the walls, but again, in the official version of events in his published account of 1905, this same llama ran amok. Change of slight word in there. He's obviously not got the memo. It should have been a mock, but we've changed it to a mock here. Same, same meaning. Yeah. So we think that potentially he looked a bit like this. If we imagine him through the British <laughs> reading of this event, he clearly must be uh, one of the personal attendants. Yeah? We've got this image of a, guy, a gigantic individual. The British Library, which is, I, which is the reason I couldn't show this photo here, is because it's in the British Library. But this man, Frederick Marshman Eric Bailey, who was a junior officer, here he is dressed in uh, Tibetan clothes uh, in 1904. 
he was also taking unofficial photographs during the mission. And he took this photograph. On the 18th of August, 1904, and here is our uh, monk who ran amok. Now, this was, this was not somebody of gigantic proportion. This was somebody who had a personal reason for going into this camp, because it's reported also that his brother had been killed at Gyantse during the fighting. So he had a very particular personal reason for making this, what he must have known was going to be a personal sacrifice. Because as we read on the end, and something that young husband missed out, they not only tried him, but they hung him in Lhasa the next day. Okay? So our images, our objects, they challenge very clearly the narrative that is put forward in texts which is why objects are so important. We often forget to think about them, just to use them as illustrations. But actually, they can challenge those written archives, the texts that we hold so dear. We always return to the truthfulness of the printed word. But actually, in many ways, objects and images can change, disrupt what we think we know from those archives. Yeah. So there he is, just a close-up. I find this an incredibly poignant image. And when I first saw it, after reading all of those reports, I was quite, yeah, it's quite distressing and shocking to see that, actually. Because the British had wanted to portray themselves as defending the honour of certain people. This was an uncivilised individual attacking a, a civilised uh, compound. And actually, this was about... Uh, somebody's personal loss and personal sorrow that they wanted to make right. So where does our silk road fit into all of this? As I said, the British had to find other ways to collect. And so young husband was not satisfied with taking that man's life. What he also did was to ask for a fine. Now, he asked for a fine because his wife was constantly sending him telegrams saying, I want silks. I want you to send me clothes back home. I want something from Tibet. I want some silks and brocades. And so when he not only took that man's life, but he asked for a fine. Now, we have it record recorded that the fine came from the Lhasa government, but potentially, uh, Tashila said it could probably have come from Sera Monastery, which is where the monk was from. So, but we know that a fine was paid, and it was paid in silks. And as you see here, young husband said, um, so besides having the man hung, I demanded a fine in either cash or kind. So today they brought me masses of the most beautiful Chinese silk dresses and I'll buy some in for you. So the British you know, did seem to have some sense of moral uh, conduct in that they didn't just take the stuff. They paid what they considered to be a reasonable price for it so that they could put it into their personal collections. So this is a wife, a letter to uh, his wife dated August 1904. So this object in a museum could be classed as Chinese, actually has this very troubling, difficult Tibetan history associated with it. And it is important then for us to trace those itineraries of objects very carefully, which is why it takes so long for us to change the narrative about what Tibet is in the museum and what it potentially can be. But this robe, along with many objects in National Museums Liverpool's collection, helps me to challenge what I think I know and what I think Tibet should be in the museum. It helps me to think about different messages, different themes, different ideas that we need uh, to include in our representation of Tibet. Because at the end of the day, we are still colonial tools. There's no doubt about it but we can still challenge from in, within what we think we know. And so in 2020, and I've put this call out um, to spread the world, word really, is I'm going to produce uh, an exhibition at uh, National Museums Liverpool at World Museum uh, called Tibet Dreams and Realities. And it will look at some of those imaginings that we've thought about in the early 20th century, but what it will also do, we'll think about exile, forced migration, what it means to be Tibetan in the 21st century. 
And I don't want to do that alone. I don't want that to be just my voice. I want there to be many uh, contributors, uh, micro-curators, if you wish, involved in that project. I'm very influenced by this museum, the Museum of Ethnography at Neuchâtel in Switzerland, that seems to have this incredible knack for producing very thought-provoking and challenging exhibitions around the idea of what it is to be from a particular place or to be represented in a particular way, and I will use that uh, as a guide. So, thank you very much for listening. You can contact me on all of these different things, um, but do watch out, because I'm just, this weekend I am frantically now putting the last bits together of a new blog, WordPress, uh, which is Object Lessons from Tibet and the Himalaya, and that will uh, record and show some of these objects, but also the process we're going through in terms of interrogating collections. We're going to go to collections right around Europe and show what they have in these collections and think about the different ways that we can challenge them. And I'd hope that some of you will contribute to that discussion. Thank you. Of course, you can read and, and you can read it that way. Sort of slow down development and reform and modernization of Tibet, which might have happened and made Tibet slightly stronger and more resilient. I don't know if it slowed down anything, but it did destabilize. And I think that's I think that's the key thing, in that it showed that there was an interest from an imper another imperial um, entity, and that then made Tibet very interesting to many other people. So I think that's I, I think this it was a de it, the British mission to Tibet was a very destabilizing act. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Now whether that slowed down development, I don't know. I can't say. I'm just merely a curator yeah, who no. deals with objects and what they tell us. So in terms of bigger geopolitical questions, that's really difficult for me to answer because I, I'm not a historian. I'm a museologist. Yeah, well, maybe, Distinction. Maybe, maybe there's a case that there was obsessed with the, the production danger. Of course, yeah, that's why they went. The great game. Yeah, of course. Uh, maybe underestimate the danger of, of China in the long run. I'm sure they understood. Uh, sure. Had they perhaps made Tibet slightly so it supported Tibet rather than destabilizing it. Yeah, of course. Maybe the, the, you know, the history would take would have taken a different course. It possibly could, but there were so many treaties in place. Tibet was a non-entity to the British. Let's be frank, it was. And the treaties were involved everybody around Tibet, but only sort of included Tibet in sort of a an add-on in some cases. So we have treaties, you know, where it was very clear that the British could not get involved. And they would break these treaties if they did. So there's a whole range of things that the British are thinking. Obviously, they want to expand not necessarily their territory, but they want to expand their influence. There was no interest of the British in actually taking territory. They didn't have the men. They didn't have the manpower, woman power, to put in more posts in, in Tibet. So this was more about extending influence and showing themselves to others. This is not the first time. No, it's not the first time. Yeah, precisely. There's many other moments when this is happening. This is just visible because of photography. About the date, you know, about the capturing of the monk. Yes. In one of your pieces, you mentioned 29th of yeah, so that's when the um, that's when that's when it was recorded in the newspapers. So this is this is the times and this is the date that it was in the newspapers. So it was recorded in the British newspapers first, and then it went out to the colonies. So here it is, two days later, in Australia. So, so actually, he was arrested before 18th. Right? So we've got him here arrested on the 18th. I thought, yeah, I can't remember. I didn't, okay. I didn't remember the Fine. date, but there we are. Uh, and uh, another thing, the silk, it's a lay person's, lay official dress. Yeah. So I presume it's not from ceremony. They are demanding from the Tibetan government. Yeah. So the government has supplied something yeah. suitable for him from aristocracy. Yeah, possibly. So I don't think, yeah, look, it's, I don't think it's from ceremony. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, you know, it looks like... Potentially, I mean... 
we have to think about the treasuries and the gifts that were in the treasuries and anything. You know, the, whoever was giving this just yeah, thought, yeah, whatever yeah. we can get rid of, they're let's dealing, give it to the British. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so they've gone through their inventories and thought, whatever we don't need, we'll get rid. Might have come from the family originally, but um, when I've looked into the archives, it very clearly says Lhasa government. This came from the Lhasa government. Yes, so it's not from Sarah Monastery. But it, it's clear Sarah is not part of Lhasa government. But you can't always trust the colonial archives. That's the thing that we that I've been saying all along. So you know they don't always know exactly what's happening. The British, even though they state something. They would have robbed, but actually, anyway, so the government yeah. said from Lhasa government. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. So it, it was it was definitely given as a fine. Yeah, sure. They didn't steal demanded it, it, but they demanded it. Yeah. Yeah. Civilized way of robbing. <laughs> it's a very nice civilized way of robbing, isn't it? Yes, yes, actually, yes, it was in uh, uh, what point you should they call uh success when this are uh, emperor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So, so it has it <laughs> Precisely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks for staying. Oh, was that a question? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day in the sunshine.